Okay, guys, um, this is the start of the live lecture for chapter 12. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started because it's right at a little after one, or about 101. So I'm just going to get started. And if people come in, um, you know, you'll see them probably pop up on the screen. Uh, but I do have my chat up in case anybody needs to, uh, to chat. Um, <clears throat> okay, so today what we're going to cover in social psychology is chapter 12, which is aggression. This is a pretty short chapter, um, so it's easy to cover in this time frame, but I do like to have a little bit extra information here and there. Just It makes it a little bit easier to, to, to follow along. Um, okay, so let's talk about aggression. All right, so what is aggression? Um, the important thing to consider about aggression is it is actually intentional behavior. Um, it's not something that's accidental. Um, it's not, you know, an accident, like you trip over somebody and hurt them. Aggression is intentional behavior and your, your aim is to actually hurt someone or to cause pain or to do harm to someone else or something else. And there's two types of aggression. You have instrumental aggression, which means that you're using it as sort of a means to an end. Okay. So you're not necessarily trying to um, hurt somebody, you're just using it as uh, to meet a particular goal. So for example, let's say that you are playing a sport and you are trying to get the ball. Um, you know, you're going to be aggressive and you're going to sort of get at somebody, but you're not necessarily, um, you know, you're not angry at that person, you're not mad at them, you're not trying to hurt them in a way that's going to sort of, you know, ruin their life. You're like, I'm playing soccer and, you know, that person has the ball and I'm going to knock them down or get through them to get the ball. The goal is to get the ball. The goal is not, oh my goodness, that person makes me so angry. I'm going to just hurt them. So instrumental aggression is all about a goal. Okay. And using aggression as a means to a goal. Um, and you're not angry and you're not causing pain to that person, in, you know, intentionally in order to you know, that's your goal. Your goal is to get something else. Hostile aggression is when you're actually angry and, you're, and your aim is to hurt that person as much as possible to inflict pain. So let's say you're playing a sport or playing soccer and somebody says something to you about your mom or says something, you know, really nasty to you and you're, you don't care about the ball. All you want to do is hurt that person. So you're going to, you know, your aim is to inflict pain. So you're going to go at that person and you're going to punch them in the face. You're going to knock them down. You're going to kick them. And your goal is, you know, to hurt them. And it stems from anger. So when we look at evolution and that perspective, now we talked before in this class and, 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 and I've said before about this idea of um, sort of thinking about the evolutionary perspective and some of the social things that we do. Um, if we as a species have lasted this long, have lasted hundreds of thousands of years, obviously some things that we're doing is beneficial. That are, some of those things are beneficial to our species survival. So anything that we can think of that has been um, around that is ingrained in our behavior, ideally, the idea is, is that it has served a purpose at some point. So when we look at gender differences and aggression, an explanation for why men or males tend to be more aggressive could be to secure their status. So we've talked before about this idea that, you know, thinking about mating as very biological, you know, very, very basic idea of mating. Um, when we think about, um, a man and a woman, you know, being together and, and producing, you know, children, the idea is that a woman will want a man who can provide resources. Um, she wants a man who can provide protection. And so a man is going to be more aggressive in order to uh, be able to provide those things and to show that he can provide those things. So um, he's going to be more protective and be more jealous um, you know, and if another man comes around, he's going to want to, you know, fend that male off because he wants to be the one to mate with the woman. And the idea is, is that the reason why men tend to aggress sort of jealously is to make sure that they are fathering the children that they're, that they're producing. So if they're not aggressive towards other men and protecting their woman, right, then other men can sleep with their woman and then they don't know if that child's theirs or not. 
So the idea behind aggressing jealously is sort of ensuring that that child that's going to, you know, result from that relationship will indeed be the, be the man's child. So this is, you remember, you know, thinking about this from um, an evolutionary standpoint, um, you know, the idea is, is that this is securing, you know, relationships and securing paternity in those relationships. And so, you know, you might ask questions like, well, what, what are the gender differences between men and, and women in terms of, of aggression? And so if you look at kids, right, um, you know, you might observe little boys roughhousing and playing really aggressively and go, wow, boys are definitely more aggressive than girls. And if you look at, I mean, all you need to do is watch a group of kids. As a mom, I can tell you that I go to a lot of birthday parties and I'm not a huge fan of kids' birthday parties, but I try to make the best of the situation. And I like to observe the children at those birthday parties. And so what I tend to do is kind of watch how they behave amongst each other in their same gender groups versus against each other. And if you read in the research, what you'll find is that yes, boys, young boys tend to, and even men, tend to aggress more physically compared to girls. However, it doesn't necessarily mean they're more aggressive. It just means they're aggressive in a different way. So when we actually look at aggression in other animals, and if we look at aggression in, in children and in adults, we actually do see some, some very significant patterns. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, aggression and, and boys versus girls in just a minute. But one thing I really wanna, to, a key point here is to make the statement that boys and girls are, ha express the same amount of aggression, they just express it differently. So when we look at aggression in other animals, um, again, we see patterns. We see patterns um, based off of type of animal. Um, in your slides on Moodle, what you'll find is that these, um, the, the description of these uh, pictures are reversed. Um, it says chimpanzees on the left and bon uh, bonobos on the right, and this is actually, this is correct, what you're seeing here. So bonobos are actually found um, to be much less aggressive than chimpanzees, their, their, their uh, primate relative. And so when we look at aggression in, in, in those species that are closely related to us, it really sheds light on if aggression is really necessary and if we absolutely, as a, as a, as a species, have to result, resort to aggression. And we're going to talk about um, a little bit later, we're going to talk about this in, in a little bit more detail. But what I want to kind of point out here in, in terms of like, uh, do we have to aggress culturally or, or is it circumstantial, things like that. When you look at uh, aggression in other animals, what you'll find is that chimpanzees tend to be very aggressive. Um, they will kill um, babies. They'll kill each other. Um, they tend to act very aggressively towards other groups of chimpanzees. They'll do it to protect um, feeding grounds and, and their territories, and they tend to be very aggressive just in general. Males tend to be very physically aggressive as well. Now, um, and they do eat meat, and they do hunt, and they do actually eat you know, they, they, they are aggressive and they do actually eat meat, but, you know, I'm talking about specifically aggression towards themselves, towards their own groups, as well as neighboring groups. Um, bonobos, on the other hand, are actually very interesting how they, how they do things. Um, if there's a conflict, they're actually more likely to mate. Um, and so that's why this idea that bonobos would rather make love than more than war. If there's ever a tense, a tense sort of situation or before they go hunt or before they, that they actually go into sort of a group orgy where they go and they actually mate with each other and then they um, kind of uh, reduce a lot of these aggressive uh, emotions by engaging in these um, uh, these types of activities that connect them together. So even though B uh, bonobos can display aggression and do engage in, in, in things like hunting and stuff like that, they actually are more um, they are less likely to engage in aggression towards one another and more likely to engage in really opposite activities that brings them closer together, like grooming, mating, um, and, and just overall physical touch. So we do find that not all animals and not all of our relative animals 
are uh, act in sort of this sort of crazy wild animal way that some of them don't necessarily need to act in an aggressive manner to get what they need to do. So this is where we come in of, of is aggression necessary? Well, um, aggression is actually considered an optional strategy. You do not need to act aggressively in every situation. And what we do find though, is that in humans and in, in other animals, the capacity for aggression does exist. It does make sense to do it, um, depend, to express aggression depending on certain things. Like for example, circumstance. Um, if there, uh, what, what we find is that not, not all cultures and not all groups of humans engage immediately in, 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 in aggressive behavior um, or express aggression as their first sort of, uh, you know, first thing that they do. What we find is that some cultures, if they are, uh, if, if aggressive behavior, an expression of aggressive behavior is, is something that the culture is known for, like think to like Sparta, right? Starting children very early and engaging in war. And there's other cultures around the country and other tribes around the country, uh, around the world, excuse me, that, um, that, aggressive behaviors and violent behaviors are sort of ingrained in the culture and it's sort of the first things that the that children are taught and so we know that because some cultures don't follow that that route that it is not something that is absolutely ingrained in all of humans that they immediately have to go towards aggressive behaviors or express aggressive behaviors we know that some cultures can be very docile very peaceful but when a circumstance changes that makes something like food unavailable or some resource very limited, what we find is that group of, of, of people will then resort to aggressive behavior um, to protect themselves, to protect their resource, whatever it may be. So you might find um, in, in, in the history of human existence and and if you look at there's so many different um cultures and so many different groups of people to look at but there's so many examples and the book gives some really good examples too of different cultures that start out peaceful and then start uh and then become a more violent culture because it was necessary to protect a particular resource or protect the group for for whatever reason so if for example food was plentiful um, you know, hunting grounds are nearby and everyone's happy and, you know, there's gathering the food and there's plenty there. They tend to be, you know, a group of people it's, may tend to be more peaceful, but once another group kind of comes in, starts taking over, taking some of those resources, or if there's like a drought or something where those resources become limited, you'll find that those cultures will then switch to a much more violent, aggressive uh, behavior. So, um, this, you know, thinking back to, okay, so what are the differences in our current culture of, of gender differences in, in aggression? What we find is that men and women are equally aggressive, but the aggression type is different. So men tend to be more physically aggressive, whereas women tend to engage in something we call relational aggression. And this is things like, um, you know, uh, this isn't physical fights, but you know, they may start a rumor, they may shun a group member, um, they may, um, you know, stab somebody in the back, things like that. And I'll give you guys a, a really good example of something that I witnessed. And this starts very young. And we'll talk a little bit about um, children, I think in this, maybe not. But I'll tell you a little bit about children. So um, I can't, I couldn't remember if I'd included the slides in this, in this one or not. Um, when it comes to children, what you find is, um, that the, the patterns of behavior that, that they're going to display as adults start very young. And if you've been around kids, then you'll know that some of these uh, behaviors that they engage in um, are actually pretty surprising because you think, oh, you know, we, we model behavior, we learn behavior, and then, uh, you know, it's an eventual thing over periods of years and, and things like that. I was at a birthday party for, uh, for um, a little girl and I had, I have an older son, so my son was there. Um, and it was two and three year olds, okay, two and three year old children at this party. And the, uh, one of the little girls uh, um, said, um, she came up to me and she was really upset. And I was, I was wondering, you know, what was going on with her. And, and, she, and I said, what's wrong? And she said, um, I didn't get a hair bow. 
And so I thought, okay, well, um, that's, you know, did they run out? That's not fair. You know, this is a birthday party and everyone's supposed to, you know, have party favors and all that. And I said, so let me, let me uh, figure out what's going on. And so I asked a little girl whose party it was. And I said, um, you know, so-and-so didn't get a hair bow. Um, do you have another one? You know, what's, what's, what's the deal here? And she actually said to me, she goes, Oh, I don't like her. She's not getting a hair bow. And I could not believe, I just, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You know, these three-year-old, very young children are essentially isolating this little girl um, and they're shunning her and they're shunning her through the, uh, through the, through the weapon of a hair bow. Um, and so, you know, and I said, well, you know, that's not very fair. Let's be nice. And so I went and got her a hair bow because there were extras. And so, you know, I mean, it's so, it's funny because when you're in a situation and you've got some of this knowledge and what you'll find yourself doing is applying this social psychology knowledge to everyday situations. And you're going to find that you're going to notice these sorts of things a lot more often. So if you're around a bunch of little kids, listen to the conversation, listen to how they act. You'll find that boys tend to, when, you know, if they have a disagreement, they tend to sort of, you know, jump at each other and, uh, you know, they'll ruffle each other's feathers and then they're fine. And then they run off. Whereas girls will tend to hold on to, to, to things and bring things up and say mean things and say, Oh, well, you know, I heard that so-and-so pooped your pants and, you know, even though it's not true and, you know, go off and tell other kids. Whereas boys, if you say, Oh, I heard so-and-so pooped his pants, you might go, yeah, ha ha ha. And then tell you all about the poop. So, you know, it's very interesting to see these kinds of gender differences and it could be culturally specific um, in terms of what kinds of, of uh, aggressive behaviors we see. But we do find again, that, that men and women, boys and girls, males and females uh, do aggress equally. So a lot of times when we talk about aggression in general and we talk about violent behaviors and violence in general, a lot of people immediately think that it's a, a violence from stranger to stranger. Somebody comes up with a gun and, you know, shoots somebody. Somebody comes up and hits somebody. You're in a bar and there are a bunch of strangers and they're all yelling at each other and fighting. But what we find is that about 49% and this, this uh, number might not be as up to date. So it might actually be a little bit more than this. 49% uh, of violent family crimes are actually against spouses. Um, and so we see that there's a lot of internal uh, crime amongst people who are family and who are, who are relatives. 84% um, of that, uh, of that statistic of the, of the victims were actually women. Um, and then eight in 10 murderers of family members were male. So we're seeing that there's a lot of patterns here when it comes to intimate violence um, in, in intimate partner violence. And so there's a lot of effort to try to, to how do we fix this? How do we help this? And, you know, there's, we were, we're not going into it in this particular slideshow, but in the book, and, and you can see here and there, there's not a great section devoted to it, but we do find that um, partners who are in violent relationships do tend to stay um, in those relationships for much longer than they should, if not, you know, forever for many, many reasons. And that's not something that we're going to get into too much detail, but obviously a lot of those reasons, a lot of times they revolve around children. And so they don't want, you know, whether it's a, um, a male being violent toward a, a female or a female being violent toward a male, whatever it may be, whatever, whoever is perpetuating violence or both, um, a lot of cases it's, it's the, they're actually both the victims and both perpetrating violence, both, both partners. Um, what we find is that if there are children involved, um, involved a lot of times a partner won't leave because maybe the other partner has financial stability, um, emotional, some sort of emotional stability there more so than if they left them, they feel like they don't have anywhere to go or they're scared. Um, a lot of times many, um, partners are scared for their life and feel like if they left, then their partner would find them and kill them or hurt them or kill their children or hurt their children. And so there's a lot of reasons why people tend to stay um, and then go back to that um, sort of uh, cyclical violence. Um, and we're not going to get, like I said, unfortunately, we don't have time to get into that today. But if you look in your book, there's a little bit of information on that. And, um, and if you go into some of the um, 
uh, social psychology and sociology classes, you'll learn a little bit more about that uh, specifically. Um, so what are some of those influences on, on um, expressing, expressing aggression and what, what, what uh, impact do those have? So obviously alcohol can be a major influence on aggression. You might have somebody that you know who is very kind, very nice, but once they start drinking, they become very violent. Um, alcohol does inhibit um, your filters. It inhibits your ability to control your own behavior. So whereas a person might be a very kind, warm, generous, nice person in, in reality, they have a lot of self-control. They're, you know, they're not going to hurt anybody. Once they drink alcohol and get that, get that um, chemical in their system, what ends up happening is that it influences the brain and it makes them less likely to be able to control their own behavior. And so if they feel an aggressive response, if they feel a, like uh, attacking somebody, that inhibition, you know, it, it is essentially blocking. It's blocking their ability to say, no, I, I shouldn't do that or blocks their ability from thinking I'm going to get in trouble or I'm going to hurt that person. And so when that's blocked, the person will just do whatever they want and they'll engage in that aggressive behavior. So, and that's another reason why a lot of people will not leave their partner because if their partner's an alcoholic, when they're not drinking alcohol, they may be a, the best partner, kind, generous, you know, super stable, a wonderful person, but once they engage in drinking alcohol, that's, they become someone else. And so partners may not want to leave that person because they say, I know that that's not who they are. And I, you know, as long as they just don't drink, then we're, then we're all okay. But unfortunately, um, you know, if they, if a person doesn't have the self-control to stop drinking and they engage in that violence, you know, they can, they can hurt somebody, kill somebody um, under the influence. And of course, that causes all sorts of, 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 of issues in of itself. Um, another thing that um, impacts aggression is pain. So you might have seen um, an animal in pain, an, an injured animal. Um, let's say they got hit by a car, or you know, if you're hunting and you shoot an animal but don't kill it, or if you, um, you know, whatever it may be, a sick animal that's in pain. What you might notice is that they tend to act really aggressively. So if you go to like pick up a, an, an injured dog, it might bite you. Whereas otherwise, if it wasn't injured, it would be fine and it would never bite you. Um, we know that pain increases aggression. There, uh, you know, any kind of discomfort, um, pain is going to increase agitation and that animal is going to try to fend for its life. Even if it's an animal that's, you know, uh, a pet is going to feel scared and doesn't want to hurt anymore, doesn't want any more pain inflicted on it, so it may act aggressively. And so this is the same in humans as well. You might notice that if you're in pain, let's say you broke your arm or you hurt your leg, or even if it's something like you have a headache, you tend to be a lot more on edge. You might be in a bad mood. Um, you might snap at people verbally. Um, that's aggressive expression. That's expressing aggressive behavior. Um, and so, you know, whenever we're discomfort, not comfortable, we tend to engage in more aggressive and 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 um, and uh, violent behavior. Um, discomfort, of course, increases aggression. That could be it's hot outside. It's humid. Air pollution um, can affect your breathing and affect how how you feel, and it's just you feel uncomfortable. Um, being around a really stinky odor, um, I don't know about you guys, but I see that, uh, especially in the area that I live in, there's a lot of skunks, and something will happen where a skunk will get hit by a car, and that thing will just sit out there and rot, and it just, like, it stink bag, like, lets out, and it just smells awful, and you might find yourself super on edge if you're in a situation where the smell just will not go away, and you're just it's grossed out. And so you might snap at people and that's because you're not comfortable. But what we find is that very interestingly, um, when you are hot, you tend to really um, engage in aggressive behaviors like humans in general. In fact, when you map this out in terms of heat index and how people engage in particular aggressive behaviors and violent behaviors, there's actually a pretty consistent pattern here. So when you look at it being cold, right, people don't want to get up and riot because it's cold and you just want to sit in your bubble and, you know, warm up. 
as the temperature increases. So if you look here, um, there is uh, on the, on the um, horizontal axis is the temperature in Fahrenheit. So as the temperature starts to rise from about 75 to the 80s, you see that the likelihood of a riot jumps considerably. And once the temperature reaches in the hundreds, that is when it is at peak likelihood of people acting aggressively and violently in a situation outside. Um, and um, this, this was uh, really uh, an interesting pattern that uh, many uh, experts said that um, during the 70s, when there were a lot of riots um, for the civil rights movements in the 60s and 70s and, and, and civil rights movements, um, what was really interesting is that they sort of predicted if there was going to, when there was going to be a really hot summer, that there was going to be an um, excessive amount of rioting. And that's because people were uncomfortable. You know, if you don't have air conditioning, you're outside, it's 100 degrees, it's super humid, you know, that's enough for anybody to get agitated and add that, um, you know, add civil dis, you know, disturbance in the mix, then you're, you have a recipe for disaster. And what they did find is that people do act much more aggressively and they'll riot and they'll, you know, throw things and hurt people and steal stuff when they're super uncomfortable. And of course, a uh, high heat index will, is, is certainly a catalyst for that. So another uh, interesting thing about aggression. So you know we we, we talked about um, being uncomfortable. You know we talked about being in pain. Um, another interesting thing that Im impacts aggression is frustration. So there's a theory that <clears throat> when you are frustrated, and frustration simply means that you are being prevented from from att uh, attaining your goal. You're, there's a blockade or an obstacle in your way, and it's, it's frustration it actually increases the probability of you being aggressive. Um, and so the closer you are to the goal and you're being disrupted, the more frustrated you get and the more frustration you feel, the more aggressive you, you tend to be. Um, and then if you uh, experience uh, this frustration unexpectedly, the more unexpected it is, the more aggressive you may, you may act. So I'll give you guys an example. One really easy, typical example is traffic. So if you are from Southwest Virginia, if you're from Wise, if you're from the Wise area, and you've never been in a bigger city, um, then you have never experienced true traffic. Um, if you go to Atlanta, if you go to um, Detroit, um, if you go to uh, LA, Los Angeles, um, that is traffic. That is, uh, well, let me tell you, one time I was in, De in Detroit traffic, actually this is multiple times, I'm going to pull out one instance. Um, if you look around you, you will see people um, actually will bring books, like novels, and they'll lay them on their steering wheel um, so that when uh, they are stopped, they can sit and read a couple of pages. So traffic is you know, when we're talking about heavy traffic, we're talking about you're at a standstill, you're not moving forward, and you're sitting there. And if you are driving in this traffic uh, to get to work, and your your goal is to get to work on time, it can be very frustrating um, to have this obstacle of traffic in your way. And that's, that's frustration is that, you know, this perception that you're being, you know, um, prevented from from your goal. And so if you are, if you live or, or are in Detroit or Atlanta or, you know, LA for a long period of time, you come to expect this traffic. So you're going to be frustrated, but you're not going to be as frustrated as if you were in a situation where you're not traveling during rush hour and you're trying to get somewhere and the traffic is unexpected. So you're going to be frustrated but not quite as much because it's an expectation you know if you're traveling in Detroit at 8 a.m. there's going to be massive traffic um, and so um, when the situation is unexpected let's say you're traveling um, in Atlanta at I don't know what's it's always rush hour in Atlanta um, let's just say midnight okay and it's backed up wall to wall traffic, you're going to be super frustrated because you're like, why is there traffic at midnight? You know, the, the, it'd be super uh, unexpected. So 
I have asked you guys in the in in this class to give me information on um, uh, driving. So, like, if you're in a situation where someone pulls out in front of you, or you pull out in front of somebody, and I want you guys to kind of think about how that relates to some of the things that you're learning about at the end of the semester. Um, but one thing that I notice a lot of people will admit that they do tend to have a little bit of um, road rage. And so, you know, some people have admitted that, you know, they're in situations and you know, somebody pulls out in front of them and they're yelling at, you know, uh, obscenities and giving them the finger and, and all sorts of things. And, um, and okay, you know, people do that. And when it's unexpected, when somebody pulls out in front of you, you don't expect that, um, then of course you become even more frustrated because that person's in your way and now you have to actually do something because they're, they've, they've made themselves a problem of yours. So when we think about frustration in general, right? Just because you're frustrated doesn't always mean that you're going to act aggressively, right? So you may, uh, I'll give you guys an example. Um, my children are very um, messy sometimes. So um, I'll give you guys an example of my, my older son who's about to turn six. Um, I remember when we were about to leave, uh, this one sticks out in my head just because I remember how frustrated I was. Um, so we were about to leave to go to, I was gonna drop him off to daycare and I was gonna go work. And he was standing there and he had um, a, a big, bottle of water and I told him not to open the water and he of course is I think at the time he was about three so he had no care about what I said and he opened it up and he proceeded to take like one of these and go like this well these tops here are wide mouth tops so of course he nearly drowned himself basically waterboarded himself and it covered uh, his entire outfit and then got all over the floor. So he dumped a, you know, 24 ounce uh, water bottle all over the floor, all over himself. And we were like already late because I'm a notoriously late person. So we were already late. Now I had to get a bunch of towels to clean up the mess, get him into new clothes. There was water on me. You know, there was, there was a big mess. So I was extremely frustrated, but even though I was, it, I was angry Okay, it, it, it uh, increased my anger. Um, I was not aggressive. I did not act aggressively. I didn't, you know, spank him or hit him. It was an accident, you know. And so um, in that moment, when I was frustrated, um, if he were to do anything that were to, you know, continue the frustration, it would actually increase your readiness. It would have increased my readiness to uh to act aggressively. So, you know, to snap at him or to yell or to, you know, spank him or something like that. So, um, when you are frustrated, it, it doesn't always lead to you acting aggressively. It does, however, intend to increase anger and it increases your readiness to be aggressive. Um, now you can probably think of a lot of situations where you um, were frustrated, but you didn't act aggressively. And a lot of reasons exist for that. So for example, if it's understandable, right? Um, if whatever the frustration caused was is legitimate or an unintentional. So what reduced my likelihood of acting aggressively toward my son was the fact that it was unintentional. Now, of course, I was irritated that he chose to not listen to me and he opened the water anyway. He didn't take the the water bottle and dump it on the floor. He legit tried to drink it and it just, he was three and couldn't handle it. So it was unintentional. And so that reduced my likelihood of acting aggressively simply because I knew it was an accident. I'm sure there are plenty of um, examples you guys can think of when you're driving down the road. And I've done this before. Um, you come to a stoplight and you're behind somebody and the light turns green and they don't go. Okay, and I've done this several times. And so it doesn't go, they don't go. And so you wait a second and they still don't go. So you start beeping the horn and they still don't go. Well, if the person in front of you broke down, right? So at first you're like, what is wrong with this person? To, you know, why do they have a license? They can't look at you, know, stop picking your nose and look at the light. You start yelling at them and you get, start getting all worked up but then you realize they broke down and they can't help it. And they might wave to you and say like, I'm sorry, like I can't, you know, 
I can't help it. That's a legitimate, you know, thing that happened there, right? And so you go, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you don't act aggressively toward them and you forgive them and move on. Also, um, so if it's, if it's understandable, you're like, okay, like, you know, I get it. Like somebody stops in the middle of traffic to let somebody, somebody who fell in the road, you know, get up right? That's legitimate and understandable. Then you're like, okay, you know, I see you've held traffic up. I'm sorry, let's move on. So those, in those cases where, you know, you actually will feel that frustration completely dissipate as you're driving and, and you see something happen that's legitimate. Everybody's slowing down. Well, they're slowing down because something happened ahead of them. Now, if they're just slowing down because they're, you know, trying to look at an accident or it's not legitimate, then you, you know, you get frustrated. But if there's a reason for it, you can actually feel yourself immediately, you know, sort of lift off that, that frustration kind of lifts off of you and you don't, you don't attack anybody. You don't yell at anybody and you don't think violent thoughts. So when we think about um, how we learn to act and behave aggressively, um, if you guys remember in intro to psychology, you guys learned about social learning theory. And so this is this idea that we um, observe people like our parents and people around us and um, those people model a particular behavior. behavior. And we learn that behavior by um, observing them and by imitation. And so aggression is a perfect example of a particular behavior that we can actually learn from others. Now, if you're in a family where you have very violent parents, um, you know, very aggressive uh, siblings, you might actually learn to imitate that behavior and become aggressive yourself because that's what you grew up with and that's what's normal to you. So social learning theory comes from uh, Albert Bandura's work. So if you guys remember Aunt Bandura's experiment where we had the Bobo doll, which is the big um, blow up uh, toy where you punch it, it's weighted on the bottom, you punch it and it kind of moves back and forth. Well, in his experiment, he had a bunch of children watch a video of adults acting aggressively toward the doll. And then um, when they were given the opportunity to play with the Bobo doll after watching the video, those children who watched the adults beat it up and hit it and smack it and use a hammer, they actually modeled that behavior and did that, uh, that those aggressive acts toward the doll versus the children that watched the adults not act aggressively toward the Bobo doll. They did not uh, they did not act aggressively toward the Bobo doll when they were given a chance to play with it. So we do know that children do imitate our behaviors and, and adults are models and other children are models for um, particular behaviors. Um, and so this brings us to this idea of media violence. So if you are watching violent television, you're seeing actors model that behavior, doesn't that make you more likely to engage in violent behavior? Well, this has been a debate for quite a while. In fact, it was um, it really started with video games um, during Columbine. So during the Columbine shootings, um, there was sort of this release of information that the shooters were big into aggressive and violent video games, and that's the reason why they went and shot a bunch of people at a school. So this this research has been going on for decades to decades to try to understand do. Uh, you know, playing video games, violent video games, and watching violent movies and violent um, TV shows, does that actually make a person more aggressive? And so, um, you know, when you're playing violent video games, you know, you can actually shoot people in the face and you can, you know, hire a prostitute and you can shoot that prostitute and steal a car. I'm thinking specifically of Grand Theft Auto, but there are a lot of different games where you can actually go in and do violent things as, you know, a sort of first person shooter. Um, and so a lot of the research does say that when you watch violence, it does increase aggression, aggressive behaviors. It makes you more angry. It increases those angry, anger, um, angry and hostile thoughts. Um, but does it mean that you're going to engage in more violent behavior? The question is, is what is the relationship? What is the true direction of the relationship? Yes, we find that there are children who watch violence on TV and in the media, and those same children may play violent video games, 
And we might find that those children engage in more aggressive behaviors. But the question is, is the violent watching or playing video games causing the aggressive behaviors? And we cannot make that distinction. We, we cannot say that watching violence and playing violent video games causes violent behavior. And that is because all of the studies that have been done in the past few decades have all been correlational. And so if you guys remember from the very beginning of the semester, we talked about correlation. And there's no way that you can say A causes B. You can say a lot of different things about the relationship in terms of association, but you cannot say that that one causes the, the other. Um, what it could be is that people who already have a predisposition to being aggressive prefer to watch violence because that speaks to them. It could be that they're brought up with this around them, not only watching it, but maybe their parents and siblings are violent. And so it just so happens to be that they, they both co-occur. Um, you know, it could be that watching violent TV and playing violent video games does make people more violent, but it could be a small percentage. But we can't say that that is a blanket cause for everything. There could be a third variable that's not, that we would not immediately expect to be related that could be causing both of those things. So it could be genetics, it could be environment, it could be a mix of the two. Um, and there are a lot of different scenarios that can um, explain these relationships. However, because all of these, these um, studies have been done with correlational research, essentially they take a bunch of people and they see, do they act aggressively? Do they watch TV? Do they play violent video games? And then they make these statistical connections, but they don't take people and, you know, and grow them up. They, they don't take a group of people and say, you're never going to play a video game and you're never a violent video game. You're never going to watch violent TV. And then another group and say, that's all you're going to do. And then test them at the end to see how aggressive they are. <laughs> we don't do that because it's unethical because you can't box people up and make them grow up that way. Um, so because of that, we can't say for sure if, if, if this is actually causing that behavior. And so for the longest time, a lot of people would say, oh yeah, you can't watch violent TV because it's going to make you a violent person. A lot of times, for a long time, people said that. But now we're no, now we realize, hey, these relationships are just correlational. So it's very important. So one uh, another interesting thing about um, sexual violence is that we see that, um, and I think that I really think that this has become much more common knowledge now. Um, it, for a long time, people um, didn't realize when it comes to sexual violence like rape. Um, a lot of people just assumed that rape was something that a person's, a woman's walking down the street and, you know, a stranger comes out of the alleyway and holds her down and rapes her. What we find is that, um, about 85% of all rapes or attempted rapes are actually acquaintance rape, meaning that the, the woman knows or the person knows who that perpetrator is. And that it might be that it was a, a date. Um, you see, they were dating somebody or had dated somebody, a, uh, a friend, um, a friend of a roommate, um, somebody they met at a party, it could be any of those things. And so what we find is that the majority of these rapes and attempted rapes um, that occur actually not strangers, it's people that, that know that this person. And we talk a lot about women getting raped and, and women uh, experiencing sexual violence and, and, and having, um, you know, and, and being victims of sexual assault, but it absolutely happens to men too. Um, it can be man on man, it can be woman on man. There's a lot of situations that can occur um, where uh, men are victims of sexual assault. And what we find is men tend to be less likely to report it because they're embarrassed. Um, you know, if they report it to the police, they may feel like somebody says, you know, why are you complaining? You know, somebody wants to have sex with you, what, what's wrong with you? And so, you know, that is a, that's a really bad um, stigma and the stigma gets attached to that. Um, and then a man can feel embarrassed or insecure. And so, but it's important for, for me to, I think it's really important for everybody to know that it absolutely does occur. I um, mean, it occurs a lot more often than we think because men aren't reporting um, sexual assault. And, um, and a lot of times they, they feel perhaps like it's a boss 
It's somebody who uh, has authority over them. Um, and that can, can play into it as well because they're afraid to, to report it for retaliation. They don't want to get fired or you know, anything like that. But when we look at specifically uh, sexually aggressive men, so when we look at, um, and, and, and most of this, is, it, this work has been done on um, violence against women, so looking at an, a sexually aggressive man who is likely to um, perpetrate uh, sexual violence on a woman. What we find is that many of those men tend to be narcissistic. They're very involved in themselves. They think they're the, you know, sun result revolves around them. They think they're the most important person on the earth and that, you know, that they are uh, more important than, than, than who they really are. And they think a lot of themselves. Um, we also find that those men tend to, to not be able to empathize with women. Um, they kind of put women into a box, into a category and dehumanize them. And so it makes it easier for them to be able to per per uh, uh, perpetrate violence on them. Um, they might also uh, feel hostile and contempt toward women. They may hate them and say, um, you know, they're just here to serve me. Um, and so again, this sort of dehumanizing process, which you'll find in, in, in the prejudice um, chapter as well, is a way to make it easier to um, harm another person because you're seeing them as less than. And when you see someone as less than, then it's much easier to, um, to hurt them in, in any way without feeling remorse. We also see that these men tend to feel the sense of entitlement. Um, you know, uh, they may think that you know, women should be throwing themselves at them and they feel that they deserve to get laid and they deserve to have a woman, you know, pleasure them sort of thing. And they also tend to misperceive women's behavior. Um, and so this is really interesting because, um, so this kind of also ties into the sense of entitlement. Um, they may go to a bar and a woman might be trying, a, a woman might be trying to, you know, politely decline their offer or politely decline them, but that it might be misperceived as them being, um, you know, uh, basically being a bitch. And so they may say, oh no, you're just acting this way. And, you know, you, you know, and, and she might not be acting that way. She might just be being polite, being kind, and, you know, might be misperceived by the man. Also, um, you know, uh, they might think that the woman's provoking them physically, um, or, you know, making jokes about them and it might anger them um, and make them more hostile to a woman. Um, they may see a woman as flirting when she wasn't. Um, and, uh, you know, you see this a lot of times and, and you can actually uh, see this in social media a lot where you'll see that a man um, might text a woman, right? Um, let's say it's a, a, a dating um, app or you know, uh, using messenger or something like that. And a man may say, you know, you're so hot. And, um, the woman might say you're not interested. And then he comes back and says, you're fat and ugly. Anyway, I don't want to sleep with you. You know, that sort of thing is this kind of group of people, this kind of, you know, narcissistic, uh, hostile, um, aggressive type person. And you see that a lot on social media. There's a lot of, of women who will post, uh, post on um, these pictures and say, hey, you know, this, this man is, you know, acting like a jerk, basically. Um, and so that, that tends to happen. So um, I'm sure many of you have probably seen examples of that on social media. Um, so, and, you know, when we think about uh, aggression and in children, especially, and how do we, um, how do we address a child acting aggressively? You know, should we spank the child? Should we use aggression as a form of punishment? So a lot of people are going to disagree with this, and this is just, okay, that's fine. Um, you know, in terms of spanking and, and you know, being aggressive with children, um, some people say, oh, the old-fashioned way of spanking is fine. I turned out fine, and I was spanked. Sure, that's fine. But we do have studies that actually show us that, acting aggressively toward a child actually models the behavior. So we talked about social learning theory and we talked about modeling and imitation. If you use an aggressive act like slapping, hitting, punching, spanking, okay, because that is also an aggressive act, you're, you're actually 
using your hand or a switch to, to smack somebody. Um, that is actually modeling that aggressive behavior and it could result in the child in imitating that action. Um, you are essentially the model for the child and if you are going to model hitting, um, then the child may continue hitting or, or hit in the future. Um, what's interesting here, there's been a little bit of work done on this idea of mild punishment. So if a child is acting out, um, the idea is that you want to not overly punish the child for acting out. And so if you m give a punishment that's just at you know, the, the, this, the right level or just under the level of, of what's just justified for the act, the child has to now think about that behavior and punishment together, right? And justify to themselves if they've done that particular activity. And then what can happen is, is if the punishment isn't overly excessive, they may actually think, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't do that next time. So they actually have to justify their own restraint, justify why they were not punished excessively for that particular behavior. So if, you know, they hit their brother or sister, giving a very mild punishment, like saying, let's say they really hurt their brother or sister, and then saying, you know, I'm just going to make you sit in time out for five minutes. Um, or, okay, you're going to, you know, you don't get TV for 10 minutes. That's a, that's a relatively mild punishment. Well, now that child has to think about what they did and realize, well, I didn't get spanked or hit, or I didn't get anything excessive thrown at me. You know, now they are in this sort of what we refer to as um, cognitive dissonant stage, where they have to you know, make this change. Do I change my behavior for the future or do I, you know, continue on and, 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 and exercise, um, you know, this autonomy and try to see if I'm going to get punished again. So there's this kind of this battle going on. Um, and so there has been some work to show that if you don't excessively punish for something, um, even a, even a, you know, kind of a, a more, um, higher, uh, uh, disruptive behavior that it could actually result in better attitude change in the end. Um, so a couple of questions that you guys might have is, um, you know, does acting aggressive reduce further aggression? So <laughs> usually uh, the example is given is um, somebody does you wrong, right? And it makes you angry. Some people will say, take a pillow and just punch the pillow. Okay, so act aggressively or punch the person out or, or, or scream or, you know, um, push something. Excuse me. The idea is, is that um, if you get the aggression out, it'll feel better and you will not, um, you will not engage in aggressive behaviors in the future. Turns out that's actually not true. Okay. Um, what turns, what, what, um, what tends to happen, uh, and, and this is kind of, this is more describing, um, this, this is kind of describing both. So does direct aggression against the source of your anger reduce further aggression? This is more like, you know, screaming at someone, yelling at someone, punching them. Um, does that reduce further aggression? And the answer to that is no. It turns out that it actually, aggression begets aggression. The more likely when you act aggressively towards somebody, you're actually going to be much more likely to act aggressively again towards them. What it ends up doing is it puts you at a faster readiness to act aggressively the next time around. So if you punch somebody in the face and you're like, man, I feel great, man, that was great. You know, I'm, you know, I, I got them. I, I, you know, I, I, I did that aggressive act. Next time that person you know, does something wrong to you in the future, you're going to be actually quicker to punch them again. So directing your aggression against the source of anger um, increases the likelihood of future aggression faster the next time around. Now, this idea of does aggressive behavior reduce the need for further aggression? Some people will say, go and do, uh, you know, if you're an angry kid, go play football, right? What we find is that um, that's actually the reverse is true. If a child is playing in a competitive game um, and, 
experiences frustration, experiences an environment that allows them to act aggressively, they tend to act aggressively more so in the future. So it increases their need for further aggression. So we have this in ca this case of not only does acting aggressively and acting aggressively in a normal situation, like playing games um, and doing things that, you know, um, require you to experience violence or experience aggressive behaviors or expressing those behaviors, it will actually increase the likelihood of you doing that again in the future. So, you know, um, some people will say, well, how do you control, like, what do you do then? If you're, if you're, if you're uh, angry and frustrated, you know, how do you manage those feelings so that you don't act on them and you don't become violent? And there are several, you know, ways that we can sort of control our anger and deal with our anger. So ignoring it is obviously not smart. Bottling it up is not smart. But there are ways that we can sort of enable it actively to make it dissipate. So this is going to sound kind of cliche and silly, but these have been shown in studies to actually really help. Doing things like counting to 10, you're giving yourself time to think. You're giving yourself time to experience the anger and time to let it dissipate. Okay? You're not bottling it up. You're not acting aggressively. You're not going to go punch a pillow. You're actually going to take the time to sit and process the anger. That's what's important is processing this. So counting like to 10 to 20, taking those deep breaths, calming yourself down. Remember there's a physiological response when it comes to anger. It's not just this emotion. It's you know body temperature, it's heart rate, it's pulse rate, um, it's breathing. All of these things are involved in feeling emotion. So if you can calm that down and quiet it down, what will happen is, is that you will then let it dissipate and process that anger. Also doing things like taking responsibility, apologizing when you're in the wrong, you know, apologizing when you're angry, um, writing your feelings down this is something that we don't tend to do a lot this idea of self-awareness figuring out where you know where you became angry and why you were angry and who you were angry at and how you can talk and communicate better to avoid that in the future all of these things are very helpful to actually process your feelings instead of just bottling it up or just trying to punch something out um, you know you want that to dissipate in a healthy way and so when we look at studies where um, instead of acting aggressively, um, instead of punishing children in an aggressive way, if we work on our non-aggressive behavior, we're modeling that to children. And when they see that the adult is counting and they're breathing and they're apologizing to another adult or even apologizing to your child, what they find is that, hey, that adult is expressing themselves in a calm, respect, respectful manner, even though they, was, they were provoked. And then they know, okay, now I can do this as well. I can handle my own frustrations without acting aggressively. And so modeling that behavior really does help children understand that they can, in fact, act in a way that is not, you know, in the moment of anger. And then they know that they can, even if somebody is provoking them, handle their own frustrations with less aggression it, on the playground, you know, in the classroom, whatever it may be. And um, so that kind of brings us to the end here. Um, if you have any questions, you know, you can email me um, and I'll be happy to answer those. Um, this will be the last live lecture so that I have planned unless I get emails that say, please go over something else. But I might put up a couple of videos and there's going to be another video on prejudice um, that's going to be recorded. Um, so hopefully you guys uh, have everything down. If you have any questions, you know you can just shoot me an email and have a great rest of your weekend.